Welcome back, everyone, to this final session of the afternoon, which will be led by our wonderful co-chairs, Malia Fullerton and Melissa Davis. We will um, try to summarize everything that we have heard this afternoon. So I will um, pass it on to them. All right. Thank you so much uh, to everyone, to all of you um, for being here with us <laughs> for over the course of these two days. I think we've had a very, very rich discussion. Um, and we do have a, a high level summary of the recommendations that, that we could quickly step through. Um, and I don't know, Melissa, if you think that's the best thing for us to, to move forward with, or if we should just start with some high level comments. What do you think? Um, well, I think that, well, first of all, I agree. Thank you everyone for your participation. Um, I think that we could start with some high level comments if you'd like. We try to take um, some of the um, information that we gleaned from day one and create a word cloud. Um, I don't know who's sharing right now, if you have that, but we wanted to share that with everyone. Um, one of the things that definitely is, is a key term here is populations. And I think that I've learned a lot. I've discovered some things, especially from our presenters. So thank you to the presenters who came and shared their expertise. And I think, you know, as we depart today, one of the things we need to uh, identify are, are ways we can take action. So what are some of the things we need to do moving forward based on what we've learned and discovered here today? And I think first and foremost is that the discussion must continue um, in meaning that as we um, do this research and all of us are doing pivotal research that's very necessary. I'm, I'm very encouraged about the diversity that we're seeing that now creates the context in which we have to have these discussions in order to understand how best to represent and respect to the communities that we are studying. And so, I mean, I have some take homes that, you know, we can go through. I think that we can continue to have um, some feedback I would love to know from the audience, anyone who has been uh, enlightened to the point of making changes in the way that you do your research or how you might alter your study designs based on the information today. So I don't know, Malia, if you would like to, um, we can just alternate like thoughts if you, if you will. Okay, all right, that sounds really good. Um... Yeah, and I I don't have a copy of the word cloud right to hand, so I can't I can't share that out. Um, I will say, uh, you know, I think there was a little bit of a dis discussion yesterday. I do feel as though, in some ways, this has been although our conversation has been focused, of course, on legacy data and the varying understandings of legacy data. I do feel that a number of our conversations are kind of a, been a, at a community level returning to and thinking very deeply and critically about the very important set of recommendations that the National Academies gave to us uh, in the spring of last year. And, um, I, I would say if I had to kind of identify one overarching theme that has come through, certainly in this last discussion that we just had, but also throughout the report outs yesterday from the discussion groups, from the breakouts, is this need to bring um, enhanced thoughtfulness to the work that we're doing. Um, and that it, and that is such an important recommendation. It's an essential recommend, recommendation, and yet at the same time, it's quite nebulous, right? It's like, what does what does enhanced thoughtfulness look like, right? Well, certainly not just reverting to 
uh, OMB categories because our funder asks us, <laughs> right? Um, and oh, great! Here's our word summary. So you know, sort of being being critical and thoughtful about what population means, and really thinking carefully about. Uh, the ways in which we are trying, what we're trying to do with our science. I mean, are we are trying to tackle a really important health outcome disparity for a particular community living in a particular geographic location in a particular, you know, with a particular kind of social identity and set of social relationships? Or are we trying to say something about a patient who's walking into a clinic, right? And, and depending on what our, our primary purpose is, there will be different ways to understand and think about population and population descriptors. And I think as Jen left it, Ideally, we would include as much rich information as we can, and then as we are trying to make sense of it and reporting it out, of being careful and thoughtful in how we report that out, right? Um, I think we continue to wish for, and I think the National Academies did the best they absolutely could, a set of really kind of coherent one, two, three recommendations, do this, don't do that. And in fact, I think in practice, it's going to be remarkably more complicated. Um, and ultimately, many of these issues about genetic similarity, principal components, and how to think about that is about what I would call kind of um, population equivalence. And how do we understand um, reference in the context of the work that we are doing and that is a very very that's a very very complicated analytical question so those are some higher level thoughts from me melissa i think you were you were sharing out that word cloud please go ahead yeah, uh, yeah. um so um i don't know so first of all let me make a confession that um, the topic that we're discussing often leaves me feeling uneasy um, because um, most of the work that I'm doing is related to trying to improve the outcomes of a particular community or a particular group of people who have been overburdened and underserved and um, disrespected and even harmed um, by some of the outcomes of the type of research that we do. And so I'm, I'm kind of driven in my purpose to right some of those wrongs and provide a way um, to make sure that they are represented. And so I understand then the apprehension when we kind of fall into this um, space of categorizing people with labels that they don't want um, that labels they wouldn't choose for themselves. But then as a scientist holding data and needing to be held to a certain rigor, needing to identify a way that we can purposefully and intentionally extract useful information out of this population level data set. And so I hear, I heard the word create, creating proxies, you know, other than the labels that make us uncomfortable. But I think that comes right back to having sort of the circular argument that we're still categorizing individuals um, based on our interpretation of who they are. And so to that, I would say one of the take homes that I'm, you know, walking away with is to be very specific about, I mean, we've already said that you need to think about the purpose of your study. But I think we also need to be very intentional about um, how we um, communicate, you know, what we're, what we're doing. We've already said that you need to provide rationale for the use and aggregation or alteration or harmonization, you know, many different terms are being used here. Um, so we do need to define our rationale, but then how do we communicate that? to each other as scientists, but then ultimately to the communities. I think in order to continue to improve on the way that we approach these types of questions and you know, research um, study designs, 
we have to include the communities. I mean, I guess some of my discomfort is that a lot of the dialogue that's happening here, even amongst us today, is being had in the absence of the communities that make up the populations that we're studying. And I, and, you know, and maybe what you're studying, you might feel, well, you know, I'm looking at a specific gene or the mechanism of a gene, or I'm trying to determine if this drug works well in this population or broadly. And so you may feel like you don't necessarily need to engage with the community or you don't necessarily need to understand social determinants, but maybe you do because maybe what's happening is a gene interaction with the environment right, that marginalized individuals live in. But, you know, even outside of that, we're not necessarily even just talking about disparities. We're talking about the diversity even in the European population, right? If we are looking more carefully at genetic background, which I think is the point here, um, is that we need to include diversity, then do we need to define those differences or do we need to define similarity? I think that your purpose needs to be clear. So if we're monitoring diversity, then yes, there are categories that currently we have to use as those proxies because as was suggested in terms of measuring genetic um, sequencing, you know, genomes or even using chips, chips which by the way, don't necessarily include all of the variation that we need across the global population because we haven't defined that yet. Um, I think that you know, we need to be very intentional about what we're using it for. And then maybe under those categories of monitoring versus describing versus um, discovering, then within those categories, we can state clearly what is allowable and what's not allowable. And then always coming back to the people who we're talking about and, and, and getting their approval in some form or another. So, I mean, Malia, if you don't mind, maybe we can open up a general discussion um, if um, there are any lingering questions or comments anyone else wants to make in terms of um, your revelations today. I think we have some time for that. Or Malia, how would you like to move forward? Yeah, um, I, I, um... I'm very happy to open it up. Um, or if people don't have specific comments or questions, we could try to quickly scroll through kind of the the synthesis of the preliminary recommendations that have come from the the work group discussions. Um, but love to open it up to see if people have any high level comments or thoughts or things that perhaps you hoped we had discussed that we did not manage to get to in the course of the last couple of days, a very rich discussion. Uh, Alice. Thank you, Malia and Melissa, um, for the recap. I, I guess one thing that I was hoping that we might get more deeply into, which I don't think we did, is looking at legacy data sets, both the data and the samples and thinking about how we use population descriptors in relation to biological samples that have been banked and data in databases that are associated with those samples. And, and then just thinking about, you know, does, does a cell line have a racial identity? Um, and if it does, like what it, why and and how so i guess that's just it's just more of an open question and something we're dealing with in the human pan genome project about you know how are we thinking about um categorizing or 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 associating population descriptors or not and what are the what are the benefits and the utility of doing that versus you know what are we potentially risking if we don't um and and then what how what potential harm could we be causing by including those labels either associated with the samples and or the data Mm -hmm. in, a, in a reference resource 
Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you for that comment. Um, that is something that we spent a little bit of time. I just I know because I was there in the group talking about ambiguous consent and we did bring that up as an issue. But I agree that we did not give this as much attention as it deserves. It's a, a topic that I know is being actively talked about in the context of the Brain Initiative, for example, as well. Um, and I agree that it's one that requires more sustained discussion of how we think about the attribution of social identities to uh, disembodied biospecimens and, and, and where that sits with regard to different types of use cases. So thank you for that. Um, Julie. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to raise up Dr. Davis's point about um, how we really need to keep the community in mind, especially with how we're going to present this work moving forward. Um, how are how are all of the groups going to know that they fall into this reference genome? <laughs> you know, like how you know how are they going to see themselves in the science, and um, and how are we going to make that clear and bring everybody along, um, and not just make a greater divide between the research academia, ivory tower, and um, and the people that we are actually trying to serve. Yeah, that's so great. I, thank you for um, raising that um, raising that point or amplifying it, I guess. Um, I don't know. I mean, so one of the things that I, I think about, too, and maybe, you know, this can help guide some thinking and, you know, garner some more comments is, for instance, even with certain race, ethnicity categories where, you know, within the United States. So when we recruit in in, in New York and, and when we have to capture information that then becomes the legacy data annotations and we're limited to, you know, whatever we had at the time. And sometimes that's the intake form at the hospital. Um, if the patient or the participant doesn't go through a full survey um, you know, sort of this recategorization, and I guess it kind of gets to the cell line issue as well. You know, we may perceive someone to be African American because they're of African descent, primarily living in America, but there are communities who would not self identify as African American who do have a significant amount of admixture. And perhaps even very similar, genetically similar admixture, but would not necessarily be comfortable by being grouped with African Americans, you know, socially um, speaking in terms of their, you know, social history. So I'm thinking about Afro Caribbean populations, for instance, uh, Afro Latino populations. I think that is important that, um, again, in the context of why you need to understand who a person is or who a sample came from, what is the utility that you're trying to gain. And, um, you know, that is actually useful in, in your context. So, but, but I agree, as we think about how to communicate to one another and create best practices, we also need to think about how we are going to educate the community about what we're doing and um, make sure that they play, play a role. Uh, Marilyn, see your hand. Yeah, I, I wonder if we can have sort of an interim place here until we get things fully worked out. Um, so from my point of view, as having a large genetics portfolio, uh, we have two different kinds of data on the same people. The first is their self-report or what the investigator reports. And then we do analysis and we have additional data. So the... Um, so we have, we actually have, are in a place where we have both types of data and we can, for for people who want to use their self-report, do that, because we have that, and we have the genetic reality. So there are both things that can be used and they pre and post analysis is maybe one way temporarily, so we get this figured out to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, thank you for that, Marilyn. I mean, I think it certainly aligns with whether, I don't think it's a kind of an either or, um, I think it's a both and. 
yeah. uh, in 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 many respects, and um, and is has been talked about by a number of our speakers. They're going to be different ways in which different features of the data um, rise to prominence in the context of our analyses. I think one of the things that I, I would urge caution uh, with regard is to thinking about genetics as somehow being understandable or interpretable in a vacuum. Um, the genes that we analyze are in bodies uh, that exist in broad social context and walk through the world. Um, and the expression of those genes is is never separate uh, from the the lived experience of the per I, I can just use myself as an example. I've been thinking about this as various people are talking. I am ascriptively white of European ancestry. I've never done an ancestry test. I imagine that probably my genes would confirm that. I grew up on an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, most of what I grew up, most of my friends, most of what I grew up eating, most of the way I, my early lived experience was Pacific Islander and Asian influenced. I then spent most of my 20s living in Europe and then moved back to the United States. Which of those pieces of my identity, my genes, my ascriptive identity, the way that I was brought up, where I lived, the foods that I ate, the way that I walk, walk through the world today, which of those identities matter to the health concerns that I have? And I have some pretty serious health concerns, actually. So these are this is what gets, gets to be so complicated, I think, in these conversations. And um, and I think it's what we're struggling with, you know. <laughs> anyway, I see, I see that a couple other hands have been raised. I also see some calls in the um, chat for us to quickly romp through the recommendations as we have synthesized them. So I'm going to allow uh, Tess uh, to make your comment. And then I'm, I think maybe, um, Melissa, if you're OK with it, maybe we need to spend a little bit of time taking a look at the synthesized recommendations before we let everyone go. So Tess, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. This is a very uh, timely discussion. Uh, I also want to, you know, from our genetic class, uh, genetics is uh, already fixed at birth. So there's no much change as a result of the living lived experience you mentioned. Can we incorporate other omics and other factors in terms of descriptor? Why we limit descriptors with genetic ancestry instead of all these multi-omics resources that's available to us? A great Thank you. point. An excellent point. <laughs> um, Melissa, should I share out the slides or what do you think? We need to share out the slides or, you know, because they're very complex, but sure, you, you can. And while you pull that up, then um, if, if you think they will be useful, I think it would be, actually. Yeah, I, I think it probably would be just to very quickly. Um, there was a comment about potentially next steps involving a community forum, and I think that we can look to our NIH colleagues about Mm -hmm. something like that and um and and absolutely right so elizabeth uh gillander has mentioned the pecgs which has a mechanism available for um reaching out to patients for, yeah so, but i think we have a, a number of those options yeah yeah um Yes, and I so so just very very quickly, and and not going through this point by point, but just a very quick summary of some of the recommendations as we have come to kind of think about them in broad brushstrokes. And this is based on some of the discussions that happened yesterday. Is that we need to be paying very close attention to the assumptions. Uh, that we bring to study design, including whether and when to use population descriptors, whether and when to harmonize genetic and non-genetic data. 
Uh, we need to be also, uh, as was pointed out earlier today, recognizing that even, even measures of genetic similarity are not themselves unbiased and unsupervised, and we need to be aware of the limitations of current public data sets as we are using those to make inferences about genetic similarity. That in addition to taking care with our assumptions with study design, that we need to be making careful uh, to be sure that we're making careful methodological justifications for the choices that we're making, particularly where we do not have exhaustive information with regard to population descriptors. Uh, and, and addressing things like those category of other that are particularly a, a, a feature of legacy data sets where there was not as much attention uh, to the complexities of population descriptors when at earlier stages, as well as aspects of ascertainment and things like that. Uh, respecting and, and recognizing and having ways to keep track of people's self-identification and group affiliations um, so as not to reinforce incorrect or outdated notions. I'm jumping around, I know. This might include keeping all descriptors present in data samples, such as the data model being recommended for the prime consortia and keeping track of the provenance of descriptors when descriptors may change over time or for particular purposes. Uh, thinking about data access and use, including um, possibly statute of limitations or expiration dates on continued use of data, as well as biospecimens, as was brought up right now in our discussion. Thinking carefully and um, in concert with the NIH about the best ways to bring training and education uh, to understanding the history of the range of population descriptors that can you that we could use, educating ourselves about the history of particular collections, ascertainment biases, other kinds of concerns that might have adhered to their initial collection, even though they've been with us and they continue to be important data resources. Uh, spending a, t a time and attention, uh, thinking about the ways in which we take account of heterogeneity and the analysis of data, being careful with the use of genetically inferred labels or non-genetic strata in, in terms of what, what inferences we might draw, uh, incorporating social determinants of health into tools as we increase the wealth of, of data and information about population heterogeneity, improving methods to account for continuity. See, obviously there are very, very, there are a huge number of recommendations here. Thinking carefully about the ways in which we use population descriptors, including their colonial historical context, um, possible making it mandatory to report diversity in particular ways, being careful with terms such as self-report, if we don't know for sure that actual information was self-reported, for example, using translational framework as a guide, um, and then working in close collaboration with a wide range of partners, ranging from communities that are affected by health concerns all the way through to the research community, um, to publishers, to our funders, um, and various other advisory committees. Uh, and then thinking about that wide array of, of really um, clinical and diagnostic use cases that were alluded to by our group. I think that's what we've got. I know this is a whirlwind. I did want to share it with you all. The reports of the, of the, of the report of the meeting will go into more detail. I'm going to stop there. Uh, Melissa, I'm sure you have other things to say. Yeah, thank you for that. I think, you know, first of all, the next steps will be, of course, to create a report based on all of the discussions that were had here today. I think as um, the team goes through all of the suggested uh, actions and revisions that um, we can bring more clarity into how to move forward. Um, a couple of points that were made that I think, well, we, we should consider um, in the report that haven't necessarily been brought out. And I believe, I think it's Amber, 
yes, made this comment in the in the chat that um, I believe it was her. I can't find the comment right now, but that the current data that we're collecting now, no, it's Sarah Nelson. Um, the perspective data today are the legacy data of tomorrow, right? So I think as we think about how the current legacy data has been challenging to use for certain purposes, then what should be the perspective collection guidelines moving forward? And that brings me to another um, issue that was brought up, which is the use of data, the use of legacy data. So currently, if you go to dbGaP or any access controls mechanism, of course, you have to have a certain uh, approval in terms of human subjects, maybe or maybe not. And it really depends on the consent of the individuals who are part of the study. But it was brought up, and I'm sorry if I can't remember, it was so many discussion groups, so forgive me if I don't give credit to the right person, but someone brought up perhaps having a way, uh, I believe it's John actually, to identify whether a study has or can be used for a specific purpose. So we already do that, right, with access control data to some extent. For instance, if the data was collected for heart disease research, you can't specifically, and it says exclusively for heart disease research, you can't use it for cancer, right? And I recently encountered a, a situation where the genomic study said that you could not measure ancestry on a subset of the cohort because the participants had opted out of ancestry assessments, right? So as we go back through legacy data and maybe identify the intention of the studies, whether or not they are appropriate, either by virtue of what is available in terms of the data and or the explicit exclusion of certain uses, can we categorize what is available in terms of legacy data for specific applications in your studies? And then based on sort of that, uh, demarcation, identify ways moving forward for prospective studies to be thoughtful about that process, to be thoughtful that there will be investigators looking to use this study, you know, in subsequent research for the purposes of health disparities or for the purposes of gene discovery uh, within certain genetics, genetically similar populations. So um, I don't know where we will begin with that. You know, maybe it comes back to NIH, right? But, um, you know, I think that's something that could be implemented even retrospectively um, in, in terms of legacy data. And uh, I don't know, do you, do you guys think that would be useful to recommend? How can we be transparent? Hey, John, do you want to speak out loud about what you, what you just posted? Oh, sure. Um... Uh, I, I was able to copy and paste the slide that I'd prepared on this. It just might be helpful to, to make the idea more clear. It's, not, it's nothing more than what I suggested in the idea, but it explicitly has like the Creative Commons there and sort of a FL, AG, H is potential shorthand, quick labels. And you could imagine, as you said, DB gap being a natural place to sort of illustrate these per cohort. And it just might be helpful to standardize some of these with regards to the population descriptors issue in particular. Yeah. Yeah, I really liked your comments about whether it's okay, um, right, to re-categorize, um, if you will, um, or, or adjust labels, you know, and I think we've talked about doing just that several times in our discussions under the framework of harmonization. Um, so sometimes it's just when we harmonize our data in, 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 in the sort of annotation space, sometimes it's simply capitalization or hyphenization, right? Like that's harmonization or cleanup, I guess. But, in, and then in some cases it may say black slash African-American. And so we're harmonizing, but, you know, in the context where, you know, it's a much more sensitive descriptor by virtue of the population you're studying, you know, it needs to be explicitly stated, you know, for that particular cohort that it's okay to do this, but it's not okay to do that. So I really love that slide. Thank you for sharing that. Any any other comments about that? 
from anyone else. I noted that a couple of the authors of the NASM report were, were here. So uh, thank you for joining us. <laughs> Let us know if you would like to make any, any comments as well. And then I guess lastly, the other thing that I think is probably a good step forward that I guess NIH would also, <laughs> sorry guys, you guys have a lot of work. <laughs> You're walking away with a lot of work here. Um, is training. So not just training among trainees, but training among journal editors and grant reviewers and, you know, and, and even maybe some of the guidelines that reviewers are given by journals when considering, you know, whether diversity has been achieved, if that is a point of the study or, and to that end, you know, we've talked about how the FDA requirements are that you have a diverse population. Um, however, um, you know, how can we do that without capturing these descriptors? Because I've also seen several instances where people would just like to get, a, you know, erase all of the descriptors, like let's not use any at all and just use the genetics. But if we don't have the genetic testing done in certain populations, uh -huh. And typically that's going to be the underserved populations who are being um, strategically enrolled from community serving institutions. Um, you know, that might not be a reality, but for a clinical trial, you know, maybe that is a metric that we could move forward with. So instead of just having check boxes, could we measure genetic diversity by say a relatedness score? Um, across the cohort to measure, uh, you know, a, a significant threshold, a threshold of genetic uh, diversity instead of monitoring race. I mean, what do, what do people think about that? Is is that, you know, within the realm of possibility? Is that too much to ask? But I guess that gets back into PCAs, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think it's such an interesting suggestion, Melissa, and I like it very much. And then, but, and I worry, though, then if we we might convince ourselves that we have a genetically diverse cohort that is socially homogeneous in various ways, you know, Definitely. and, 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 um, so so it's it it solves one of the problems, but it doesn't solve all of the problems, right? So I mean, and this is I feel like what we've been all struggling with and talking about over the course of the last two days is there's a but for every solution. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's just and I and I um I do I do think this is why I think the education and training uh, recommendation is so essential. It's like how do we get people to just be more critical and thoughtful every time they come to a, a new cohort, whether it's prospectively ascertained or a legacy cohort. And I don't know if there are people out there who have recommendations for how to in, enhance thoughtfulness here. I mean, the comments coming in right now, you guys can raise your hands and speak. I mean, you know. Yeah, words. Yeah, Anna, please. But yeah, social aspects, the, the variation or heterogeneity in social aspects is lar likely larger than the genetic variation. I would say, yeah, across, across different populations, but even within a certain group, we would probably see that. I, I agree. I agree. I guess that's why we need more headings or, or categories here. Um. Malia, to, to your question of like, what can we provide that's useful to people who are approaching these data sets? Can some of these recommendations, we, are your, the synthesis you, you guys have done looks great. Can some of them be like reframed in terms of the questions that researchers should ask themselves um, as they're approaching um, that data set, as well as some guardrails that are like clear, um, that represent more clear do's and don'ts? Um, because I do think that so, so much of what we've been talking about is transparency, but there's a lot of things that go above and beyond that, which c can be very helpfully like pulled out. 
as guardrails. I like that. I like guardrails. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I like that too. And I mean, and then, I mean, where would we put that, Anna? Would we put that as people are writing their proposals uh, for, 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 for grant funding? Um, you know, uh, wh where, where would we put these questions to prompt people with? Maybe it would be something that a DB gap DAC needs, maybe it's something that needs to be there as you're filling out your, your data access request. Um, I, I don't know. Yeah. I think exactly right. And, and for those ones where you don't need a data access request, even just things which live alongside the data when you go to download it, <laughs> um, I think that could be helpful because I think so often people do want guidance. They just don't know where to turn. But if we can, you know, this is stuff which goes hand in hand with the use of the data. So getting them where they're starting to use the data. Great. Thank you. Um, Heather. Yeah. So another aspect that once we have these guidelines in place, and everything is there, there needs, what's the enforceability? What are the repercussions for not following those guidelines? Is it loss of data access? Um, what funders are have to bring, that's the carrot. Um, we, we have to be encouraging diversity and make that something that we consider in whether or not we fund a project. And this goes down to animal models where I still am seeing dozens of papers that are, we studied male mice <laughs> on this background. Why didn't you study the females? That is still a problem. And at the journal level, once all of the experiments have been done, it doesn't invalidate the science, it's a limitation of the science. And it has to be something that is forced more at the funding level than at the journal level. Yeah, I think that so, so what you're getting at is sort of like, you know, variables of biological, um, you know, gender and sex. Sex is a biological variable, that's it. So, you know, you have to check that box when you have an animal study or even a human subject study where the disease or the phenotype or whatever you're studying can impact both uh, genders unless you have a clear rationale for why you're only studying it in one sex. Um, and I agree. I've often actually said that um, in, in various forms that maybe we need to have such a mandate in a grant review uh, forum as well. But we have to first be able to define what our expectation is. For sex as a biological variable, it's very easy. Chromosomally, X's and Y's, right? You can define that genetically. You can define that by even, um, you know, broader gender identity, uh, I think. And in, in that's sort of the next step where, where that's concerned. But when we talk about genetic diversity across the human population, I think it's going to be uh, up to the scientists working with the community to first define what our expectations are. In order to set the standard that must be met, we all have to agree on what the standard is. And I think it's not just a linear right versus left. It's not a binary. Um, it, it's uh, me meaning it's not even necessarily a gradient on one axis. It's probably going to be applicable to what you're studying, you're right? If you're studying health disparities, then you need social for sure. If you're studying a genetic underpinning, then you need genetics for sure. And let's start there. And then get more deeply in, ingrained into what are the potential inflection points or the intersections that you need to study. And then that's how you define your population. And, and, I, and again, I applaud everyone for being here today and even having this conversation because 
um, you know, 10 years ago, it didn't matter, right? It's just you study whoever you study, whoever walks in the door. We don't care what their identity is. We don't care what their genetic background is. It's just a convenient sample. But we know that that's not the right way. And so I think as we move into uncharted territory, we have to have these complex discussions and finally land on uh, common ground, which might have steps and it might not be flat. <laughs> So, uh, Janella. I did just want to share, I've heard um, discussion here about accessing data and dbGaP and just wanted to give you a sense. I'm a member of the NHGRI's Data Access Committee and just wanted to share that we are very aware that you know, some of the some of the requests for data can be ambiguously um, described. And we've started engaging with requesters and communicating. Why? What is the use? Be be clear, and when you describe your study design, um, be clear on on the labels. Be clear on the populations, and why are you asking for for the request? So I think it's it's. Um, I'm glad this was brought up, and and it's something that we are committed to, and we'll continue we'll continue looking into. Excellent. Very happy to hear that. <laughs> Uh, Latrice. Yeah, so I was uh, the moderator for the um, non-health outcomes group, and one of the things we discussed was the all of us sort of model for data access, which requires you to participate in modules of learning about group harm. And we thought that this might be a good model before you can get access to the data. You do a few modules and you take a quiz to test your um, acquisition of the knowledge um, as a form of mandatory learning um, across all um, levels of, you know, beyond the trainee, as you said before. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Luigi. We have a lot more comments in the in the chat. So, I, I again, I really I really love that we have so many people here that you stayed <laughs> for two days and stayed the whole time. Um, I think we're coming close to the end of our session. Um, uh, so we will. Yeah, and I see a note from Sherry from the All of Us program saying happy to share the training. Um, I, I, I do think, yeah, that that is a definitely a possible model as well. Um, anyway, uh, yes, and the, as well as the public description. However, I, 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 I'm at pains. I feel obligated to point out that all of us does it that way in lieu of having a data access committee that, 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 that analyzes each data access request. So it's a slightly different model. And I think the, the, it's still a, a jury's out on, on how, how we think about that, but as a, as a way of helping people to be more thoughtful about their use of population descriptors as they make uh, requests for uses of legacy data for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I just, I'm going to, I'm going to close out by just again, expressing my gratitude to everyone who has spent their time with us here, who have shared of their expertise and their really good thoughts. Um, this is probably the beginning of a much longer conversation and it's just been, a, it's been a real joy, uh, to, to be able to participate it, in it with all of you. So thank you all so much again. And thank you, Melissa. Yeah. Thank you, Malia. And yeah, so Janella, if you'd like to um, bring us home, that'd be great. <laughs> I was muted. Okay. Let me go ahead and share. I as has been already said, thank you all so very much for joining us for the last two days. It has been a very rich discussion. We've touched on a lot of different points. I think we have, we walk away with some really good recommendations and, and things to, to think about. And just wanted to remind everyone of, Lucia mentioned this at the beginning yesterday, but what are we planning on doing next with this workshop? We 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 have a meeting recording that we will make available. We also will produce a workshop report 
so that everyone can see and, and understand what has been discussed. We hope that that can then be turned into a peer review publication that can be accessed and reviewed widely. But as, as was just said, this is, a, this is the beginning of a conversation and we anticipate continued dialogue with the NIH and the scientific community on these important issues. We have taken note copiously of all the things that have been said. And so we're really um, excited to continue talking internally, but also with, with all of you. I did wanna thank our wonderful co-chairs, Melissa and Malia. Thank you for this last hour. Thank you for everything they've provided. Um, feedback and input from the beginning of the planning stages all the way through today and your participation, especially at the last hour of just bringing everything together, synthesizing. I think that has been wonderful. And both of you bring your uh, great expertise in this area and we are so appreciative of that. Um, I also wanted to thank all the speakers, the panelists, the moderators, the note takers. As you know, there have been 14 breakout groups yesterday, seven breakout groups today. For each one, we had a moderator and a note taker. So thank you, all of you, for that. We also had speakers and panelists and moderators. And this workshop would not have been possible um, without all of you participating and giving us of your time and your energy. Um, I do want to thank the NIH Planning Committee. Um, it has been wonderful working across the NIH on this. I think you have heard us speak throughout um, that this is something that we are all across the NIH thinking about. We all have legacy data. We all want clear um, recommendations and guidelines for what to do with this data and into the future. And so we appreciate hearing from all of you. And, and again, these conversations that we've been having internally will continue. I want to thank the NHGRI staff for helping us make this possible. A big thank you to the Information Technology Branch, Gerald and Jacob, so much for all of the logistics and the AV that we've had, the break breakout group logistics, thank you. The Office of Communication, Jenny and McCool, for the website and for all the social media. The Office of the NHGRI Deputy Director, Karina, for helping us with slides and logistics. The TIDE Office, as the Training, Diversity, and Health Equity Office, and the NHGRI's Population Descriptors Working Group. Thank you all very much for helping us get to this place today. And then finally, all of you, thank you so very much for hanging in there with us, for all your time, your energy, your contributions, and we look forward to continue the conversation in other fora. So with that, I will say thank you and goodbye.